Hello and welcome to my easy to understand guide to the Jungle Book film from 1967. This video is going to be particularly important for you if you are studying OCR A-level media studies, as it is currently one of the set films that you will need to study. This film will only ever be asked about as an industries or context based question. So we're going to go through those things in this video. So the first thing you need to know, which I hope you know, is that this is a Walt Disney film. Walt Disney is obviously one of the biggest film production companies in the world. Disney are very famous for developing a lot of the techniques that they use themselves. Because they are a very big horizontally and vertically integrated company, they can do that. They have millions and millions of dollars at their disposal. So when they needed to do particular types of animation, they actually came up with the methods themselves. So the multi-plane animation that is used in the Jungle Book film from 1967 was actually something that Disney pioneered themselves. It allowed the film to have some quite interesting uh, kind of almost 3D type shots through the kind of jungle. Because they had a high budget, being part of Disney obviously has its perks, they were able to do things that perhaps other animation companies weren't able to do. So for example, in the sky scenes, you can see some twinkling stars, which were quite difficult. Moving water shots, also very challenging for animators at the time who were hand painting the backgrounds. So the high budget enabled them to push the boundaries in terms of the technology they were able to access and use. They are a huge, huge company. Um, they're very specific ways of doing things and at the time when Walt Disney was still alive um, he had very specific ways of doing things so he streamlined production um, he uh, less people working on animation people were very 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 busy um, and he changed the production team he didn't like the, the original script that was produced uh, he employed a new script writer Walt Disney was known as a little bit of a battle axe like he would do things things the way he wanted them done and he wouldn't accept anything less. So having him involved as, you know, one of the key people overseeing the whole production uh, has obviously had an impact on the film, perhaps made it the slightly happier, light-hearted film that you see when it actually could have been a lot darker. Disney knew they needed a success. Their last film, The Sword in the Stone, hadn't done particularly well and they really needed to make some more money with this film. So Disney, like I said, he fired the original scriptwriter, got a new scriptwriter in. He used Rudyard Kipling's book as a kind of inspiration. And don't forget, that helps to minimise risk. It's a story that a lot of audiences would already be familiar with. But he didn't want the film to be as dark as the book. And so that's why he asked this new scriptwriter to make the film lighter and more more positive because he knew that would make more money and make the film more family friendly which would help to make more profit. The previous way of doing animated films that was that they would animate the characters first and then they would get voice actors in to come and record the voices and what that meant was um, actors had to fit their voices to an animation that had already been done and Walt Disney switched this around he got the actors to record their voices first and then the animators fitted the animation to the voices and that meant that the actual people doing the voice acting could be much more creative and expressive and original and interesting and do weird and wonderful things because they weren't having to fit their voices onto an already completed animation and that meant that when the animators got to it they were able to create animations that fit the voices and that meant the characters tended to be much more expressive and interesting and that's what won over a lot of audiences. Disney knew that in order to be a success, you had to hire skilled people. So he hired several people like the Sherman Brothers, who'd had existing success with previous films like Mary Poppins. He knew he wanted some really good songs in the movie, so that's why he hired them. So hiring people that have got an existing successful track record on your film is a great way of trying to ensure that your film is also a success. Animators watched real footage of real animals to help them get to grips with how to animate the animals in the Jungle Book. And that helped to make the film perhaps um, add that slight element of realism and make it feel a bit more natural for audiences. 
They were also able to afford to use something called xerography, which is essentially a kind of fancy photocopy. Um, it allowed them to photocopy the original drawings that animators did onto the kind of clear cells that they use for animating. And that saved time in the long run. It meant that not every single one had to be drawn over and over again. They were able to make copies and copies so that they could reuse them for scenes if they needed to. Disney as a company was all about diversification. Films had always been their kind of bread and butter, their, their way of making their main money. Um, but Walt Disney knew that it, it wasn't enough just to stay in one industry. You had to diversify. So at the time, Disney had diversified into things like theme parks. Um, now, more recently, they've diversified into live action movies as well, which wasn't necessarily something they used to do a lot of. So um, diversifying into other areas of the media is a great way of broadening your audience and maintaining success and profits. So Walt Disney himself was quite a conservative, quite right-wing person. Um, it meant that he had some fairly racist, sexist and homophobic views. And you can see this in quite a lot of those old classic Disney animations from the sort of 1950s and 60s. In The Jungle Book, there are some fairly racist stereotypes, um, you know, in some of the animals where you can clearly tell they're supposed to represent the black community. Um, and since then, they've actually had to put warnings on Disney Plus uh, when people are now watching these films, the modern audiences to try and make sure they're not offended by these stereotypes. Um, and so um, the impact of Walt Disney and his own personal political views can be seen within the films that he's made, including in The Jungle Book. The film was re-released several times throughout the decades in 1978, 1984 and 1990. And re-releasing a film means that you can target a new audience each time. You can maximise your profits. You're going to earn more money. You can re-release the merchandise at the same time as well. So it helps to drum up more publicity for a film that you have in your back catalogue already. It doesn't cost you any more money because you don't have to make it again. But it's a great way of rinsing as much money out of an audience as possible. So every time the film got re-released it would have to go through regulation and control again so the BBFC the MPAA the film companies the, the organizations in various countries responsible for giving out aid certificates would have to look at it again and again and again to recertify it every time it was re-released. Disney is obviously supposedly quite a family friendly company and they want to stay that way in order to uh, you know maintain a mainstream audience and that's probably why they chose this self-regulatory idea of putting the warning on Disney Plus now for a lot of their films just to give audiences a heads up that some of the viewpoints in there are quite old historic and potentially are quite racist or homophobic. The budget for the film at the time was $4 million, which in the 1960s was a pretty hefty chunk of money. But if you have a look at the amount of money it made, it made $141 million in the US and $205 million worldwide, which is a huge, huge profit considering it cost $4 million to make. Very successful film. The film, of course, was eventually released on VHS when that technology was available in the 1990s. Uh, and then again, DVD, Blu-ray, it's now available as a digital download and on Disney Plus as well. So every time a new technology comes along, they re-release it on a new format. And again, that helps to maximise their profits and make the film very accessible for people. Now, Disney films are often what's called vaulted, and this is a quite unusual phrase, something that not a lot of companies do. It means that the film is only available for a limited time to purchase, and then it kind of gets put away in a kind of archive somewhere. So, for example, when the film was originally released on VHS, it was only available for maybe a year or two to buy, and then you couldn't get hold of it for ages, and then they would do a limited re-release. And what that was is you're controlling the distribution of the product, you're controlling how audiences can get hold of it and that makes it feel like it's rare and that you've got to get hold of it when it does get released so when they re-release it when it comes out again when you do see it in the shops people are more inclined to buy it because they don't know when it's going to be vaulted again Disney is vertically integrated. They have Disney Plus, don't forget. So that means they have their own method of distributing their films digitally now. Um, and so uh, that's obviously a great way of minimising their uh, risks, maximising their profits. Um, and they can control that. They can make more money through subscriptions. They can promote their films on there. They can also release via other things like iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Prime as well. 
they have their own distribution companies in the 1960s as well. So, for example, they had uh, the Buena Vista Distribution Company and the Buena Vista International. So they are subsidiaries or were subsidiaries of Disney in the 1960s. So having their own in-house distribution companies meant that they could keep the costs in-house. They don't have to outsource to another company. So that vertical integration where you can do more than one stage of the production process, very, very helpful for maximising your profits and minimising your costs. They did obviously have a range of merchandise available for the Jungle Book. Uh, the soundtrack was particularly popular on vinyl, obviously, because it was the 1960s. Um, but people did like that. And even still, the soundtrack is quite popular now. Um, you know, they've, re they've released uh, lots of toys, um, action figures. They've had bed linen and cushions and God knows what else. So there's lots of Jungle Book themed merchandise available. And in particular, since the Disney stores have become popular in the last couple of decades, the Jungle Book was obviously obviously been able to make more money through merchandise there as well. There was a range of other marketing done for the film as well. So they had a weekly show on ABC, which is a TV channel in America, and that promoted the characters from the show. Um, they've obviously got their Disney stores and toys. They had um, Happy Meals in the 90s when the film was re-released, uh, actually when Jungle Book 2 came out, which is a sequel, another great way of making extra profit. They um, had Happy Meal toys for that in the 1990s, which is a great way of targeting young people. And they also licensed video games to this as well in the 90s with Sega, Game Boy and the PC. So use of these new technologies that were coming out in the 90s to try and appeal to an even wider audience and make more profit. In the 1960s, though, obviously all of that was kind of uh, very difficult to do. The technologies didn't exist. So the vast majority of the marketing at the time um, existed through posters. Um, so um, print posters were one of the, the, the main marketing methods used at the time. Although, like I said, they've used other methods every time they've re-released the film since then. So that was my easy to understand guide to the 1967 version of The Jungle Book. Don't forget to check out my channel for lots of other videos that are going to be relevant to you if you are studying OCR A-level, including lots of stuff about set texts, theories and keywords. If there are any videos that you would like that I don't already have though, you can leave a comment below and I will read them and see what I can do for you.